Well, that song, Holy, 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 is actually quite fitting for the opening of my message today. <clears throat> because it conjures images from the book of Revelation of the throne of God. And that our God is a holy God. One of the things that we must always keep before our eyes and in our hearts, because the Bible makes it perfectly clear that every individual of the human race will have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, Paul says, for we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account for himself to God. Let that sink in. I think we could, it's so easy to get caught up in all the day-to-day -day stuff we have to do. Life that we miss, that a day will come when you, when I, will stand before the Lord God of heaven and earth to give account for your life. So on what ground, on what basis can we be certain that when you stand before God that you will be welcomed into the glories of heaven in the presence of Christ? How can you be sure of that? You, you, you're just going to wing it? Kind of see how it goes? I don't think that's a great plan. You need to be sure. The Bible says that it is destined for all to die once and then the judgment. One day you will take your last breath Can you be sure? Well, in our text today, I've titled it Loving Assurance because in our text, Jesus will give us this assurance. Now, a spoiler, the answer for your certainty does not come from you. You will not find it in yourself. There is none righteous here. We just sang, holy, holy, holy. That is the standard. That is the God that you will stand before. It's, he's not grading on a curve. He's not going to weigh like your good stuff and your bad stuff and maybe it'll equal out. No, that's not how it works. The standard is Perfect righteousness. When you stand before a holy God, we must have a perfect righteousness. Like I said, you will not find that in yourself. So in verse 24, so we have Jesus praying for us as the high priest, for a people who have been entrusted to him, and he places the capstone on the bridge that will lead us into heaven. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am. I like how the King James actually does, a, I think, a truer translation of the verb here that... Um, is usually translated, I desire. It uses the word, I will. And the Greek word, telos, is an exercise of the will. Now, it's not just a forensic sort of a will. There is desire and passion behind it. But it is the will of God nonetheless. And there is where we find our assurance 
The assurance of our salvation is upheld by nothing less than the sovereign will of God, the sovereign will of the Son, for the people given to him by the Father. Jesus expresses his saving will in light of his foreordained triumph in returning to the Father. Jesus says, see, he sees himself already resurrected and ascended to heaven and wills that believers will be with him and will join him. So can a believer be certain of heaven? Yes, he can. For it is Christ himself who has set forth his will for us to be with him. But by, by what right can Jesus make this assertion, this claim, that it is his will? Is it just merely a child requesting of his father that he would will that we be with him and that the father could possibly choose to do it or not? Like when your child comes to you? No, it's more than that because Christ's claim, he has a right in his exercise of his will. Namely, his redeeming work of salvation, Jesus comes forth as the high priest for his people, whom you have given me, whose names he bears, offering his blood to fulfill his covenant with the Father. The writer of Hebrews grounds our blessing on the blood of the eternal covenant. That's Hebrews 13, 20, by virtue of which Christ speaks with the right of salvation on behalf of those whom he came to die. Seeing the believer's assurance in the priestly ministry of Christ, we see the necessity of belonging to him. He doesn't say here, I want everyone in the whole world to be with me. He said, those whom you have given me. So it would seem quite important that we be certain that we are one that has been given to him. Who else but Jesus has the legal right to declare his saving will in the presence of God? No one. Who else has the standing that Jesus possesses as a holy, beloved, perfectly obedient, righteous son, armed with a covenantal authority to save God's elect? Many people reject turning to Christ as their savior. They imagine this conversation, you've probably heard unbelievers say this, yeah, when I stand before God, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind, they say. They're going to declare some supposed merits. They think that they're going to tell God all the good stuff they did. They suppose they're going to accuse God of some fault. They suppose they're going to, or some lack of evidence that maybe God didn't give them enough evidence to believe. They even probably practice these lines in the mirror. Yeah, I'm going to tell God this, and what's he going to say? <sighs> Do you remember Job? Job was a believer. There was none more righteous than Job. And Job wanted his day in court. He was going to, you know, he wanted to talk to God. Well, how did that work out? Job, in his foolishness, God does speak to him. And he says, you know, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. He realizes that God owes him no explanation. No one of us will insist to God. We will not say, I will. And the, the non-believer, this was a believer, a foolish believer. But what about the non-believer? Well, we hear about them in Revelation 6. 
You know what they will say? Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. They want the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. For the great day of wrath has come and who can stand? The reality is that only Jesus will stand to declare the sovereign will of God. Only those who belong to him, who are given to him by the Father, and who trust in Jesus as Savior, will be saved by the will of Christ, who loves his own. We must therefore believe in Jesus Christ if we are to be saved. Jesus' prayer in 7 17.24 shows not only the assurance of salvation for all those who believe in him, but also the love in Christ's heart for his people. Here is God the Son praying just hours before his torture and crucifixion. Yet his heart is lifted up for his flock. He, where is You'd think he'd have other things more pressing, but he had us in mind. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am. We see here the remarkable reality that Christ's longing for fellowship of his people he, he does not merely say that he wills that we enter into heaven. Jesus isn't saying, oh, I want them to come to heaven. No, he says, I want them to be with me where I am. We get this. You know, Jesus is all God. He's all man. And he's in this, his humanity his godly human desire for companionship. He didn't just merely die for salvation as an abstract. He died for people. He died for you. And we get this. We long to be with our own people, those we love, those who love us. And so it is with our great-hearted Savior, the triumph of the great day when he comes to judge the living and the dead will be occasion of celebration like no other, and he wants to share it with his people. As much as we look forward to the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation, so also Jesus looks forward to having us to eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, he says in Luke 22. That we would sit with him. And if you are Christ's, if you are Christ, then you are loved and longed for. I know how you feel. I know there's times we don't feel as if there's anyone who loves or longs for us. Christians are often despised in this world, but we are desired in heaven. Though we are often unlovely in appearance and character on earth, then we will be the shining with the beauty of perfect holiness in Christ. Anticipating the resurrection life that he has gained for us, Christ sees his bride even now dressed in all her glorious resurrection white with me. That's Christ's language of love for his people. His desire for our presence was foremost on his heart the night of his crucifixion. In response... With Christ is our longing for heaven. For those who know Jesus and have drawn near in love and faith, the joy of heaven is about being with Christ. Indeed, to be with Christ is the Christian's definition of heaven. 
Samuel Rutherford declared, Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven without you, it would be a hell. And if I could be in hell and have you still, it would be as heaven to me. For you are all the heaven I want. The glory and happiness of heaven to the elect will consist much of being with Christ. That is, he is our delight. So, as if heaven with Christ were not enough, Jesus now sets forth in the rest of the verse here, the crowning gift that he has prepared for his people when we enter heaven. He says, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. This is what believers have to look forward to in the life to come. It's not streets paved with gold, but the utter and complete fulfillment of our very beings. Do you know that's why you feel the way you do? That's why you feel that emptiness, that dissatisfaction, like something's missing. Haven't you all your life felt that? Because that's not what you were created for. We get in this world, it's, it's tiring. We are sick and tired of the ugliness and the sin of this world. But Paul goes on in Romans 8, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. A day is coming when we will see the glory of Christ, and on that day, for the first time in your life, you will experience utter and complete fulfillment. For this is the hope for which we were saved. When Jesus says that we will see his glory, we may consider this in a number of ways, but first, we'll see him in his true glorified humanity, in the human form that he took up in the incarnation, humbling himself and setting aside his heavenly splendor, while on earth Jesus is now enabled to reveal his glory more perfectly to the objects of his love. Do you remember when in Acts 1, Jesus ascends to heaven? The, glory, the resurrected Christ in his body ascended to heaven. Sometimes I think we forget that. And while we see Jesus in his human form in heaven, it will yet be the glory of his deity that shines on us. That will be Christ's glory that will look like. We kind of get a clue about this in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration. Remember he took Peter, James, and John up onto the mountain and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun? and his clothes were white as light. That's what his glory will look like. In our text, Jesus comments to the Father that the glory we will see in heaven is my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Therefore, it's not merely the glory of his incarnate manhood, which he took upon himself, nor merely his divine being, which Jesus possesses from all eternity. Ultimately, 
Jesus speaks of his mediatorial glory in the office that the Father has given him as our Redeemer and the head of the church. We see this in, in the ending of Ephesians 1 where Paul brings his whole statement to a crescendo. He says, the Father has given his Son in the resurrection and the ascension. Paul says, the Father raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. That is the glory of Christ. The glory given to Christ upon his return to heaven is that glory he earned by saving us from our sin and making himself our covenant Lord. Jesus adds that the remarkable statement that the Father ordained this glory for the Son because he loved, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Here again, our salvation is grounded in God's love for the Son, by which the Father willed that Christ should be glorified as the head of a redeemed people forever. We see why the scenes of worship in the book of Revelation, which one day will, we will join above, show that it is the Lamb upon the throne who is worshipped with great awe. John tells us that at the center of, of heaven's worship, he saw a Lamb standing as though it had been slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, the heavenly choir cries, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. It is therefore Christ as our mediator, Christ, the slain Lamb of God who purchased our redemption, who gained the worship of our hearts even now. It was the sight of Christ's pierced hands and his feet that caused Thomas's doubting to end when he proclaimed, my Lord and my God. That is why it is a, a lamb that we worship as though he had still been slain that we will see in heaven. Christ has declared our inheritance with him so that Christians may now see the destiny all who belong to Jesus. Paul notes that how this anticipation makes all the difference for us. This light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Yes, now we are in these bodies. Now we groan. Now there is a sense of longing. All creation groans. We groan. But that day is coming. As he said, this, it's a momentary affliction. But it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Verses 25 and 26, Jesus goes on and says, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. As we come to an end of Jesus' high priestly prayer, Jesus asked the Father to fill his people with love, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. Love is the greatest mark of the people of God the greatest mark of the church. As we end 17,
This has been a very long day. Do you remember, the day began back in chapter 13. And we're in 17. Actually, that was back in June, I think about June the 20th, we started chapter 13. So it's been a very long day. One of the longest periods of time in John's gospel. If you remember, John 13 begins with John's narration where he says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He begins this whole night before the crucifixion on the subject of love. So it seems only fitting that he ends his his prayer at the end of the evening. Because as we go into chapter 18, things will shift. Things, there's a big change coming from this fellowship, from this time as he's preparing them. But remember in 13, what, what, what's the first thing he does? He washes their feet. He demonstrates his love and he says to do this. He gives them a new commandment. This is a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. That you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So we shouldn't be surprised that he's ending this way. Jesus indicates that the source of love among God's people is a knowledge of the truth. We're not to just conjure up love. You ever try to do that? Just kind of, okay, well, I'm going to love this person. (laughs) Yeah, that last, it comes off so genuine, so. No, the, the way that the love of God is in our hearts this is by our knowledge of the truth concerning the Father. Jesus says that in order for his people to have God's love, that he has made the truth of the Father known to them. He says, O righteous Father, he prays, I made known to them your name. And this must be very important because Jesus is repeating What he had just said back in verse 6 of chapter 17, I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. So Jesus' statement tells us three important things about the truth as it relates to Christian love. The first is that the knowledge of God is the source of Christian love. In Jesus' understanding, knowing who God is, what God is like, and what God has done, this is an incalculable blessing. We should study. The whole reason we read the Bible, the reason your pastors, we encourage you, you're probably sick of hearing us every week telling you to read your Bibles, spend time with God. It's so that we get to know him. As we get to know him, that's why in like men's, we're studying the attributes of God. As we get to know, you know, God's name, God's name is inherent with his character, who he is. As we get to know him, that we may be like him. This is how the work of sanctification is worked within us by the Holy Spirit. And as we become transformed. So he makes... God's name known to us. Incidentally, this is also tied to his glory. Do you remember when Moses asked God, show me your glory? What does God do? He tells him about his character. Yes, he passes. He says, I'm going to have a pass in front of you, you know, when he has him in the cleft of the rock. But then he says, he describes himself. He describes his character. Our whole life, our whole aim is to know God. And the only place you're going to do that accurately is in the word of God. You can't conjure up, you can't say, well, to me, God is like, and make up what you think God should be like. We've got to be informed by the word of God. 
So Jesus highlights two features of God's character which moves us to love. First, he says God, it's, it's God's righteousness. Notice that he refers to the Father. He says, O righteous Father. It's not obvious in the text why Jesus would say this. He could be connecting the prayer to the previous verse in which he's claiming his right to bring the people into heaven with him. In that case, Jesus is relying on God's righteousness to fulfill his covenantal obligation. Jesus notes that God's distinction also between the world and the church. Since God separates these two groups based on righteousness, whatever Jesus' precise intent, we realize that, Jesus, that God's righteousness is essential to who God is to his name. One of the reasons the world does not know the Father is it has no idea what righteousness is. The world never imagines that God will judge all sin in perfect justice. Even more tragically, the world does not realize that God offers righteousness as a gift to sinners who trust in the perfect life and atoning death of Christ. Believers, knowing God's righteous hatred of sin, that God delights in the free gift of righteousness in Christ. We respond in great love to God for this. If, we've realized, if you were to realize God's mercy in extending righteousness to you at the cost of his own son, then your heart would be moved by the marvel of God's grace and love. When Jesus speaks of God's name, he's appealing directly to God's love. We know this because John's teaching in his first epistle, John, which actually serves as a great commentary of the theology of his gospel, but John says, sums up the nature of God by saying, God is love in 1 John 4, 8. From this, John argues that we should love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God because God is love. Jesus' second emphasis <clears throat> is that knowing God accounts for the difference between Christ's people and the world. He says, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know that you have sent me. Jesus was about to suffer the cross as the world's rejection of his revelation of God. The Jews then in the first century charged him with blasphemy since he had claimed to be speaking and acting for God. The religious leaders rejected the idea that God's righteousness for sinners which is one reason why they had so little love in their own proud and self-righteous hearts. But the followers of Christ are those who know Jesus as the true revelation of God the Father, believing that the Father had sent him to lead us both into truth and love. So verse 26 he says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. Jesus notes that he will continue to lead his people into truth, that they may grow in the God's love. There was much for Jesus yet to reveal to God about God. Christ would continue to make known to his people through the cross, through his resurrection, through his ascension, through the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, through the founding and the establishment of the early church. In these things, Christ would continue to make God known. And we should note that with the writing of the New Testament, the canon of Scripture was brought to a, a completion. Yet Christ continues today to lead his people into knowing the Father through our study of the word, our personal lives as discipleship, as disciples, and our service 
you know, to God's kingdom by the indwelling spirit of Christ in you, more and more you should be coming to greater and greater knowledge of Christ. It shows that every Christian is to be growing in the knowledge of God, especially through our open-hearted study of Scripture. And the result of our love for God and others will expand and be enriched. So how can I be a more loving husband? How can we be more devoted parents or be more obedient children? How can we have a better attitude at work or a more caring heart? It's through the knowledge of God. The answer is through our growing knowledge of God's character, his saving work as we study God's word. Because as he said earlier in seven, verse 17, we are sanctified by the truth. His word is truth. And finally, he says, I in them. The final thing we need to know about the knowledge of God and the love of God is that they come only through the saving ministry of the Son that he has sent, Jesus Christ. Jesus said that while the world does not know God, his disciples know that the Father sent him. This reminds us that believers know God through Christ. It says here in Hebrews 1, 2, that God has spoken to us by his Son. And likewise, the way that God's love animates Christians is through personal presence of Jesus. It is Christ in you when he says, I in them. It is on this theme that Jesus ends his great prayer for his people asking that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Matthew Henry comments, there is no getting into the love of God except through Christ. Nor can we keep ourselves in the love except by abiding in Christ. Nor can we have the sense and apprehension of that love except by the, the experience of the indwelling of Christ. That is the spirit of Christ in our hearts. This hope is fulfilled by the presence of Christ through his word and the shared faith of his people in the person of the Holy Spirit. This makes the point that the church that knows God and enjoys his love is a Christ-centered church in which the eyes of the believers are fixed on Jesus for salvation, blessing, and service. We will know love in all other marks of the church only as we obediently devote ourselves in discipleship in, into the living Christ. So when Jesus concludes, I in them, this corresponds to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our individual hearts and the result of our new birth into the saving faith Christians have been born again by Christ's power to the knowledge of God and his love. This means that if you wish to know God and to be set free in love, you must first submit to Jesus as Lord and trust him as Savior. This is our union with Christ that secures all, all blessings about Christ. Everything that Christ has prayed for in this last night is secured because of our union in Christ. This is where the assurance resides in us. And I in them, Jesus prays, that he will live in us if we have embraced him in simple faith. It's this, no, this is why like my favorite verse in the whole Bible is Paul's, when Paul articulates this very theme. And you can tell it strikes Paul. I think it took his breath away just to even like wrap his head around it. He says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And this life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Loved me. And gave himself for me. That's an astounding fact. This life that you live in the flesh, it isn't you, it shouldn't be you. It is Christ in you. Remember the question we began with. On what basis can we be certain that when you stand before God that you will be welcomed into the presence of Christ? Our assurance is that God desires that his people be with him. In our text, Jesus gave the perfect definition of biblical love. He said, Father, I will that they also, whom you have given me, will be with me where I am. Biblical love is an act of the will. Yes, there is emotion. He desires to be with us, but he wills. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. This prayer in John 17, as we have said, is the, the first act of his intercessory prayer. And he continues to pray for us even now at the right hand of the Father. And he still desires that you, that I, be with him where he is. And may this move us this week. As we know that a day is coming when we will be fulfilled, that longing, that emptiness, that sense of just abject dissatisfaction. We know that this world is not what we were created for. Let that draw you to him. I pray this in Christ's name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your prayer, your intercession for us. We thank you for these words in the Gospel of John. But even more, we are thankful for the words that you say for each one of us. For you know each person here, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would intercede on our behalf to the Father. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Give us a longing for you. That you would be our heaven even here. Prepare our hearts, Lord, and our minds, our desire for you. Work in us by your spirit, we pray in Christ's name, amen.